Roman Empire is no more. Only ruins remain, but those who believe in Jesus Christ carry on. This is Rome, a history in images. The followers of Jesus, empowered by the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, begin to spread the word during the middle of the first century. The image of the Good Shepherd had been a popular one in ancient Rome. It was often associated with Hermes, who carried the souls of the departed into the afterlife. Later, as they would do with much of ancient Rome, Christians began to take on this image for themselves. It reminded them of Jesus Christ, who said of himself, I am the Good Shepherd. I know my sheep and mine know me. Jesus is the one who reconciles sinners with the Father like a shepherd who finds the lost sheep and, placing it on his shoulders, excitedly tells his neighbors, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. The first deacon, St. Stephen, becomes the first martyr when he is stoned to death and a man named Saul approves this slaying. A Jewish tent maker, the zealous Saul is on his way to Damascus when he hears the voice of Jesus Christ. Experiencing a dramatic conversion, Saul becomes Paul and embarks on some amazing and often dangerous missionary journeys. Those who trace the beginnings of the church only to the legalization of Christianity by Constantine hundreds of years later obviously know very little about the early church and even less about St. Paul. By the time of his death in the mid-60s AD, Paul has spread the faith throughout various parts of the Roman Empire, establishing many Christian communities. Paul is placed under house arrest in Rome, living there for two years. He is executed by orders from Emperor Nero not long after the Great Fire of Rome of 64 AD. We will have more about the church dedicated to St. Paul in the last episode of this video series. Simon Peter, meanwhile, had been chosen by Jesus himself as the rock of the church. It becomes clear to Christians of the time that Peter is in a leadership position. Eventually, his office would become known by the word bishop, taken from the Greek for overseer. Peter would be regarded as the first bishop of Antioch and the first bishop of Rome, the first pope. Peter meets the same fate as Paul. He is also martyred probably in the year 67 AD. He is sentenced to be crucified, but upside down, because he does not feel worthy to die in the same position as Jesus. The crucifixion occurs at the Circus of Nero. Smaller than the Circus Maximus, the Circus of Nero nevertheless features chariot races, and is located just a tiny bit south of a small hill west of the Tiber River called Vatican Hill. In the circus are various decorations, including a large obelisk brought to Rome by Caligula. Perhaps Peter looks at this obelisk as he was being led to crucifixion, or perhaps he looks at it even as he is being crucified, upside down. We do not know. We do know that Peter is buried on Vatican Hill. During the ten years after Simon Peter's death and his burial on Vatican Hill, others are buried near him. It is almost as if others want to be as close to Simon Peter as possible. About 75 years later, around 150 AD, a mausoleum with Christian-themed frescoes is built there. It takes the form of a small shrine with niches. Lettering nearby seems to spell out the words, Peter is here. In the mid-3rd century, the little shrine is vandalized by those who are enemies of Christians. It is then restored with a newer wall, known as the Graffiti Wall, and marble and mosaics. Sometime around 325 AD, this shrine to St. Peter is given star treatment when Emperor Constantine, a Christian though baptized only on his deathbed, has a basilica built so that the altar would be right above the little shrine and thus right above the grave of St. Peter. 
Now this is hard because Vatican Hill slopes down on the north side. This has to be filled in to make it flatter. This includes parts of the City of the Dead, and so relatives are now prevented from honoring their ancestors who are buried there. However, the resting place of these people is respected and not disturbed, thus they remain buried there to this very day. The little shrine to St. Peter is enclosed in a rectangular marble box, four twisted columns surround it, supporting a bronze canopy. Over the years, other improvements are made. This is the first St. Peter's Basilica, and it stands here right on the grave of St. Peter for over 1,000 years. In the last episode of our series, we will talk about a newer St. Peter's Basilica that was built on the exact same spot. Over the years, the church grows. It also has some divisions, especially regarding doctrinal issues. As the Holy Spirit guides the church throughout difficult years, the word Catholic begins to be used to describe those who accept the totality of the faith as opposed to only parts of the faith. The term Catholic is first used by St. Ignatius of Antioch in 110 AD. Latin, the language of the Roman Empire, becomes the language of the Roman Catholic Church. Other terms taken from the Roman Empire begin to be used by the Church. The word diocese, for example, described an administrative district. Diocletian, who persecuted Christians, created many of these dioceses. Now the Church uses a term to describe its own areas of administration, with each diocese overseen by an overseer or bishop. December 25th was reserved to honor Sol Invictus, the great sun god of Rome. Now Christians want to proclaim the truth of their faith by changing the date into a celebration of the true Son, that is, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Thus, December 25th is Christianized and becomes Christmas, the Nativity of the Lord. Pontifex Maximus was the chief high priest of the ancient Roman religion. Caesar Augustus, for example, took on this office when he was emperor. Now that the Bishop of Rome, the successor of St. Peter, was head of the church, it seemed appropriate that the Bishop of Rome, the true High Priest of Rome, would take on the title of Pontifex Maximus. The Bishop of Rome still has this title in modern times. Pontifex Maximus, or Roman Pontiff, though the title used most often, is Pope, from the Greek word for Father. Now all this is quite deliberate. It is not to be understood as the Roman Empire somehow gradually becoming the Catholic Church. Instead, it is really the Catholic Church deliberately taking certain elements of ancient Rome and Christianizing them. The persecuted church is in hiding for hundreds of years. The celebration of the Eucharist, later called the Mass, is often done in homes. The dead, including martyrs, are buried in extensive subterranean tunnels, called catacombs. You can visit the catacombs even today, but they ask you to respect these ancient burial chambers by not taking pictures. Here is an image of the field located above the catacombs of Pope Calixtus. Now that we have laid the groundwork of the presence of Christ's Church in Rome, let us visit various structures that were built to host Christians gathered in assembly. A church is a community of believers, and so these buildings constructed to host Christian gatherings are called churches. You can't go into the very simple church of Pope St. Calixtus. It's been closed for years, but in the very early 3rd century AD, Pope Calixtus lived in a house that was located here, in Trastevere. A neighborhood of Rome. During a popular uprising in 222 AD, a group of about 20 men descended upon the home of the Pope, located here, attacked Calixtus, beating him to death. They threw his body into a well located on the property, a well that can be seen even today if you look carefully through the gate of a nearby parking lot. His body was immediately retrieved and buried in the catacombs of St. Calixtus, the catacombs he started when he was still a deacon. Later on, his body was moved to a church we will visit in a future episode, the Church of Santa Maria in Trastevere. Dying in the exact same year as Pope St. Calixtus was Emperor 
Elagabalus. Made emperor at the very tender age of 14, he had the temple of Elagabalus built almost immediately. The teenage emperor was well known for his sexual excesses and for placing his own cultic god in place of the god Jupiter. He also turned the emperor's house into a brothel, including himself as one of the prostitutes. He was assassinated at the age of 18 on March the 11th, 222 AD. We mention this because the temple remained standing for many years and was the site of the martyrdom of another young but holy man, St. Sebastian. In his 30s, Sebastian was discovered to be a Christian by Emperor Diocletian and was tied to a tree or perhaps a column, shot with arrows, and left for dead. However, he secretly recovered from his injuries, thanks to St. Irene of Rome. Later, Sebastian visited the Emperor Diocletian to warn him about his sinful persecution of Christians. He did this while standing on the steps of the Temple of Elagabalus. There, Diocletian gave orders that Sebastian be beaten to death immediately. He died on the steps of the temple. It is in this photo that we see both the Church of St. Sebastian at the top of the photo and near the bottom the remains of the Temple of Elagabalus where Sebastian was martyred. According to tradition, the Church of Santa Costanza was built by Emperor Constantine as a mausoleum for his daughter, Costanza. Some people doubt the tradition of Constantine having actually built this church, but everyone agrees that Costanza's mausoleum is, in fact, here. Though very old and in some ways very simple, the church does not cease to impress. Santa Sabina is the mother church of the Dominican order. It was built in the early 5th century. Many times a newer version of a church is built on top of an older version of the same church. A good example of this is San Clemente, or St. Clement, with a 12th century church built on top of the ruins of a 4th century church. Sorry, exterior pictures only. Picture taking was not allowed inside. San Crisogono in Trastevere is dedicated to St. Crisogonus, a martyr killed under the persecution of Diocletian. The church was rebuilt a couple of times both in the 12th and 17th centuries. The mortal remains or relics of St. Crisogonus are located in a container called a reliquary. This is visible in the illuminated opening in the main altar. In a side chapel, you can see a likeness of Blessed Anna Maria Taichi, a saintly laywoman who died in 1837. Her mortal remains are located within this likeness. Pay a small admission fee to the man waiting in the sacristy, and you can go down the steps to visit the old church, which was built during the reign of Emperor Constantine. The confusing labyrinth can be a bit trying, but is also quite interesting. Here we see a sarcophagus. Some very faint frescoes. A slab which remembers a man named Victor. Original paintings. The figure on the far right is Pope Sixtus II. And an ancient burial ground. St. Cecilia is the patron saint of musicians and was a martyr of the early church. The Church of St. Cecilia was built by Pope Urban I in the 3rd century, apparently above the house where she lived. Here we see the main level of the present church, built in the 9th century and redone in the 18th. Here it is possible to view the famous statue of St. Cecilia, sculpted by Stefano Maderno in 1599. Going downstairs, we see the columns of the original basilica, 
as well as the remains of ancient Roman homes, thought to be part of St. Cecilia's neighborhood. Last but not least, there is the beautiful underground tomb of St. Cecilia. This is a church dedicated to St. Bartholomew, located on Tiber Island in the Tiber River, very close to the Ponte Rotto we visited earlier. The church contains some of the remains of St. Bartholomew, one of the Twelve Apostles. Now, let us return to our timeline and see what happens after the fall of the Roman Empire. People begin to leave the city, and the once glorious Rome lies in ruins. Struggles between the Ostrogoths and the Byzantine Empire to control Rome ensues. It is now the middle of the 6th century, and a great deal of Rome is in disrepair. Malaria takes hold. People continue to leave Rome, until the city that once had over 1 million people now has less than 50,000. A plague ravages the city in 590. Pope Gregory I famously sees a vision on top of Hadrian's tomb of an angel sheathing his sword. The Pope interprets this to mean that the plague will soon come to an end, and it does. Hadrian's tomb is now called Castel Sant'Angelo, and from that time until this very day, a statue of an angel sheathing his sword can be seen at the top. Even at this time, the Roman Senate still exists, but seems to be in its last days. It is the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, who institutes reforms and repairs to the city. Though he is a spiritual leader, the Pope increasingly, over time and by necessity, takes on more and more secular responsibilities. The relationship between the Byzantine Empire and Papal Rome is often strained and reaches a serious obstacle in the 8th century, when Emperor Leo III decrees iconoclasm. Pope Gregory III excommunicates all iconoclasts, the Lombards ally with the Byzantines, and Pope Gregory asks for assistance from the Franks. Eventually, the Lombards grant lands to the Pope, and these lands become the Papal States. A little later on, the Lombards attack, but Rome defeats them with the help of the King of the Franks, Charlemagne. On December 25, 800 AD, Pope Leo III crowns Charlemagne, as the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Now Rome can stand on its own. The Pope, somewhat problematically, is now the ruler of the Papal States, and the Holy Roman Empire rivals the power of the Byzantine Empire in the East. In our next episode, we visit more churches, and our history of Rome continues. <laughs>